hi everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Gunnar Riemschneider. I am a PhD student here in Torino. I am working with uh, Virgo and LIGO on gravitational waves, black holes, neutron stars, and also some other more exotic stuff. And I've got a lot to tell you. Uh, I've tried to be simple. If you have any questions, please just feel free to interrupt me. Um, First, a little bit of a motivation of what I want to talk to you today about is roughly, first of all, what are gravitational waves? Uh, where do they come from? How are they detected? All these different aspects of gravitational wave astronomy. And on the other hand, why do we as physicists care so much about them? What is so special about them? What kind of information do they give us? And all this kind of stuff. And I hope I can give you some kind of idea about these kind of topics and uh, give you some understanding of what we in LIGO and Virgo are doing. Um, first, some overview. Roughly, first, I will tell you a little bit about how actually a gravitational wave comes from the source up to the detector, actually. Then, what kind of gravitational, detect gravitational wave detectors are there? Um, and a little bit about uh, what is planned and why we need them some sources that have been detected already, um, then a little bit more about uh, what we can learn from them, some shameless self-advertisement if I have time, and quick summary. Um, yes, so there roughly you see a little bit of an overview. And the top left you see uh, what is a binary neutron star. Uh, they're spiraling into each other, getting closer and closer, emitting gravitational waves until it finally ends up in a burst and they blow up a lot of gravitational wave uh, energy. Then on the top right, you see a little bit of a schematic um, of how the detection of the first gravitational wave uh, from a binary neutron stars looked like. Uh, it was first detected on the Earth by LIGO and Virgo, and then Fermi was pointed, uh, Fermi, a gamma ray detector, was pointed in that direction, and we actually saw a short gamma ray burst. And this looks on the level of the detector somewhat as you see down here. Um, there is first a laser here. That laser is split up in a beam split in two orthogonal arms and uh, bounced against mirrors, recombines and read out at a detector. And at the detector, we measure through interference the relative difference between the length in the arms and a gravitational wave traveling through the detector would actually uh, shorten one arm and elongate the other. And um, this can also happen from a lot of natural sources around uh, on Earth. But if this is well controlled, and if one is very precise about the measurement, one can actually measure gravitational waves with such detectors. And this already has been done. To give you an idea of those scales, um, for the first detection of a binary black hole, the energy output uh, in total by the binary black hole mer while merger was about three times the mass of the solar system. Um, at peak, the energy output was 50 times greater than the entire observable universe combined. And space-time is just so stiff that this was necessary to um, just, to just um, create the gravitational waves that uh, we could detect here. But still, to actually measure this, it was necessary to measure the lengths of the arms to an accuracy that was less than 10 to the minus 21 meters. To give you a little bit maybe of a scale, uh, the closest star to us is Alpha Centauri. And the equivalence in accuracy would be to measure that distance to the width of a human hair. And um, just to give you an idea, this is an incredible feat of engineering. And first it was done in 2015. Um, now we have uh, several detectors right now that are planned and built. Right now in working are the two advanced LIGO detectors in the United States. Uh, there is Advanced Virgo close to Pisa here in Italy. Uh, there is the geodetector, although it is not very sensitive to astrophysical phenomenon at the moment in Hanover. 
And then joining the effort soon will be Kagra in Japan. And also planned is li another LIGO detector in India. Um, but all these detectors cost several bi millions of euros. And why do we need several? What is the point of having several? And while on the one hand one has the argument that uh, seeing a signal in one detector could be just a fluke, could be just statistical fluctuation, seeing it in several detectors would reduce that probability and just increase the certainty of the measurement on the one hand. On the other hand, if you have several detectors, you can drastically increase the localization in the sky. For example, uh, here you see sky localizations for several events. Uh, most of them were taken with two detectors. And the two exceptions of that are GW170817, this one, and GW170814. Uh, that was a binary neutron star and that a black binary black hole. So two black holes or two b neutron stars merging together, spiraling in, emitting gravitational waves. And those two were measured with three detectors. And you can see that the localization in the sky is just drastically higher. Uh, one could just much more refine it. And through that also, it was possible to, in a joint effort with a lot of telescopes and a lot of observatories, to pinpoint actually the electromagnetic counterpart of GW170817, the binary neutron star, and say for certain this is a binary neutron star. Say there was also a short gamma ray burst. And that was actually a quite impressive achievement. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about two future detectors that are right now being planned. Um, there's, on the one hand, the Einstein telescope. Right now, people are looking for locations. Several locations uh, are in question, but uh, there are several difficult issues in choosing a location uh, because there are a lot of sources of noise just from people living there or from movements in the Earth, tectonic shifts and such. And um, the Einstein telescope, in principle, is a network of three tunnels. Each have a 10 kilometer length and would be able to, and with this telescope, it would be a possible to increase uh, a lot of the measurement sensitivity that we already have right now and do a lot more physics there. And uh, there is uh, the LISA mission, uh, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, uh, which is three satellites in space with lasers several million of kilometers apart from each other. And with that also several new physical phenomena are possible. If you guys are interested in this, I do not have time right now to go into more detail, but please check out the websites uh, that are given down there. Um, then now a little bit about the sources that have been detected so far. In the first observing run, and the second observing run, we've detected in total 10 binary black holes and one binary neutron star. And um, in the third observing run, since 1st of April in the last month, we have detected another six compact binaries. And this um, was also, uh, this is actually quite good because the increased sensitivity allows right now to detect up to one event a week, which will allow us to do a lot more physics and a lot more stuff with it. And now also what is very interesting is that all this information is public at uh, gw-openscience.org. And um, yeah, if you're interested, for example, in knowing whenever there's a new signal, you can sign up there and just get an alert every time. Um, all that is pretty pictures, nice, fun, and interesting, but none of that is much physics just yet. And there are several things that can be done with gravitational waves from compact binaries. One of them is testing general relativity, just doing robustness tests, seeing where the predictions of general relativity describe nature and where not. So far, we have found that general relativity describes it very well. Um, I have listed there several things. Uh, one can study population densities of black holes and neutron stars all over the universe, measure the expansion of the universe, uh, which is a very interesting topic all by itself. Uh, one can test the nature of black holes, 
one can see what the structure of the horizon is actually made up of. And um, if there is some physics going on there that is new, and actually also the event horizon is one of the most promising sources to actually understand quantum gravity, possibly. Um, then, uh, with future detectors, there will a couple of very interesting possibilities there too. Um, for once, we can drastically increase the mass range of binaries that we can observe up to millions on billions of solar masses, uh, with LISA especially. Maybe we can measure the stochastic gravitational wave background, which is some gravitational wave radiation stochastically from uncorrelated sources that uh, can tell us a lot about the structure of the universe all over. And also it will be possible to observe signals for very long periods of time. Um, there are also three theoretical ideas uh, that I want to present because personally they're my favorites. Um, for once, as I already mentioned, uh, we could measure the structure of the event horizon through so-called echoes that follow the merging signal of two binary black or two black holes. And uh, these would show up as small bursts of energy that would be emitted again. And these would come from the fact that some radiation would bounce off the black holes um, in an oversimplified manner stated. Then there are also two other ideas correlated to dark matter. One would be that uh, dark matter particles could form stars by themselves and these stars could form binaries and these binaries could then in turn be detected with gravitational waves. And uh, one other thing that also is somewhat fascinating is that dark matter by itself could, ex or the pure existence of dark matter could hypoth hypothetically uh, extract energy and spin uh, from black holes that are spinning fast enough. These particles then would form clouds around the black hole, would either collapse in a giant gravitational wave burst or send out some continuous gravitational waves signal over time. And both of these things could be detected hypothetically with LIGO and Virgo. Um, yes. Now I want to turn a little bit to uh, what we do here in Torino. Um, the research we're doing, and in essence, we're trying to ask the question, what do gravitational waves from compact binaries look like? Let's say you have the question, uh, you have a binary black hole made of 50 solar masses and 40 solar masses, and we are working on a mathematical model that can generate you a waveform uh, that then can be used to compare it to experimental data or to do some other physics that you might be interested in. And that is quite a technical issue because it's a little bit of a patchwork and there are several fields of mathematics and generativity that allow one to uh, give, get a partial answer, but there's no complete answer uh, just by itself. So what one does is one takes all these fields of mathematics and combines them with the so-called effective one body formalism which is a set of mathematical ideas that have been developed around 2000 by uh, the French theoretical physicist Thibaut D'Amour in Paris. And uh, with those, it actually was possible to say that the first gravitational wave detection was for certain a gravitational wave from two binary black holes. Um, and there are a lot of other stuff that one can do or that we do all of them are to some amount technical and very detailed, but if you have questions, feel free to ask, but that would be it, roughly. Um, yeah, in summary, as a brief conclusion, um, I hope I gave you a rough idea of what gravitational wave astronomy is, uh, what roughly are, it is an amazing accomplishment by a lot of engineers and scientists, and uh, gravitational wave astronomy has already detected a lot of sources and